Well, good evening. Uh, I just was told that I'm competing with the closing ceremony in Olympics. I, I cannot promise to be as a spectacular, but <laughs> well, <laughs> at least I'll try to share with you the excitement we all have uh, working on the field of metamaterials. Uh, the field is actually as old as this century, and, uh, but the good thing is uh, new results uh, keep pouring out and we get more and more excitement actually working in this field. And by no means it's gonna be comprehensive review. I apologize just from the very beginning to those whom I'm not going to mention in my talk. Uh, so here is the outline which, which I will try to cover. I'll speak of electric, well, what metamaterials are about. Uh, you basically could design and engineer the basic properties uh, of materials by uh, creating the required values and distribution of dielectric permittivity, which controls coupling to the electrical field component, and magnetic permeability, which is responsible for the coupling to the magnetic field component. Uh, so and when we speak of materials which are focused on uh, controlling uh, the dielectric permittivity, we speak of electrical mat materials, and that's, in a sense, a car of nanophotonics, which uh, keeps this promise to uh, make information processing much faster. I also will speak about uh, uh, very materi mat materials which becoming more and more functional and find more and more interesting applications. Uh, for example, in the area of harvesting light, generating electrical energy, uh, they become tunable, switchable. Uh, people employ now phase of uh, materials, uh, and that's related to coherent materials. One of the key things here to address is to use better material components. Uh, and that also will be part of this presentation. And in that I will speak about uh, really new things, very recent one, to what we call meta surfaces. And uh, you will see that even things as old as uh, several centuries could be actually uh, modified with metamaterials. New things, uh, as I said, is, uh, keep coming here. So electrical metamaterials, uh, the goal here of plasmonics, the goal here is to address the very important societal need to process information faster. And this is motivational slide, which is well familiar, uh, or at least uh, one of the versions of this well familiar for the people in the field. So with semiconductor electronics, which uh, successfully uh, can shrink uh, all these elements uh, of electronic chips down to only few nanometers. Uh, the problem is actually the speed with which you could process information. And unfortunately, there are some fundamental limitations related to RC delays, energy, optical interconnects, sorry, interconnects, and uh, the uh, speed with which you could process information in this case uh, probably limited to 100 gigahertz. With photonics in contrast, you limit it only by the carrying frequency, which is 10 to the 15, several sort of several orders of magnitude higher, but the problem how to confine light down to nanoscale in this case. And with nanoplasmonics, which is basically synonymous of nanophotonics, uh, we hope to take the advantage of both worlds. In other words, the speed uh, of nanophotonics and the size scalability of electronics. And I will show here several very important breakthroughs in the field which illustrate uh, the key elements of future nanophotonic circuitry, this particular uh, work done by Shang Zheng's group uh, in Berkeley, and this shows optical modulator. Actually, uh, many structures I'm gonna show will be using graphene, this wonderful material which uh, has been introduced to the field by uh, Navasolov and Game, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, it really brings lots of functionality. In this case, if you place graphene uh, sheet on top of a uh, silicon uh, photonic waveguide, so, and if you uh, change the voltage, you basically move the Fermi level uh, uh, and you could uh, keep it close to the uh, Dirac point. And in this case, of course, you have strong interband transition, which uh, means that there would be absorption and uh, uh, your transmission goes down. If, you, uh, if voltage is such that the Fermi level goes away from the Dirac point, then in this case, no absorption and transmitter synthesis. So you could do it very fast and it works as optical modulator, very efficient and fast one. Uh, another uh, important thing of future nanophotonic circuitry uh, is, of course, photo detector. And here you could see recent work coming from the Hallas group. Uh, they actually place plasmonic nano antennas made of uh, these uh, gold disks between two uh, graphene sheets. And uh, in this case, you could generate a photo current by using actually two mechanisms. One is uh, by uh, first exciting plasmons in uh, nano antennas, and then plasmons could decay uh, into uh, hot electrons, uh, which could be transferred to uh, graphene, or just using the local enhanced field of these nano antennas, 
which directly excite uh, charge carriers, charge carriers in graphene. So, and the surprising thing that actually uh, photodetector has extremely high internal quantum efficiency at the level of 20%. That's a very impressive result. Yet another uh, very interesting uh, hybrid photodetector, this one comes from uh, work done by Mark Bell Gersman in Stanford in collaboration with uh, Nader and Getter. And the beauty of this particular uh, photodetector, uh, they use uh, the uh, very high dielectric permittivity of silicon, uh, which is uh, comparable in magnitude to uh, uh, dielectric permittivity of uh, gold, but opposite in sign. And that actually turns out to be very important for a number of applications. And in this particular case, what it enables that such a, a photodetector could become almost invisible uh, because the uh, uh, dipole response of this uh, gold cladding uh, uh, has opposite uh, sign uh, to the response of silicon simply because the electric permittivity of metal is negative. So that in this case, uh, the uh, scattering is dramatically decreased as you could see it here. But of course, still, you still could excite uh, charges in silicon and it would work as a photodetector. So it's uh, actually very efficient and interesting uh, way to uh, develop for the detector by using these hybrid metal semiconductor structures. Uh, but the key element of uh, any future nanophotonic circuitry, of course, uh, should be nanolaser, as pointed out in work by Mark Stockman, who uh, uh, made it clear that actually a laser would be uh, acting as optical MOSFET, and a MOSFET arguably is one of the most important devices ever created, because that's what provides logics functionality of any circuitry, electronic or photonic in that sense. And here I'm showing uh, uh, quite, quite spectacular development in the area of uh, uh, making nanolasers, which happened uh, through last uh, three years or so, uh, starting from this nanolaser operating in the visible, uh, uh, which comes from uh, our collaborative work with Norfolk State University and uh, Cornell University. So in this case, actually, by uh, using feedback system for surface plasmons, which could be localized in much smaller area, uh, we were able to create nanolaser operating in the, uh, in the visible and uh, with this size, which only uh, 40 nanometers. So there is very also important work uh, done, for example, by Shang Zhang's group, and they use so-called gap surface plasmons. In this case, uh, the electromagnetic wave is confined be between semiconductor, uh, cadmium selenite in this case, and metallic plate. So these gap modes could be extremely confined, and the uh, enhancement, of course, uh, comes from the uh, semiconductor, and the, but the electromagnetic mode itself is localized between the rod and the uh, metallic plate. This first design uh, allowed lasing uh, at low temperature, cryogenic temperatures, and f uh, uh, later design uh, actually enabled lasing at room temperatures. And there are also other developments that people now already demonstrated, for example, electrically pumped nano lasers. Speaking of these lasers based on core shell structure, which I mentioned in the beginning, so with core providing feedback by surface plasma and shell, which is doped with dye molecules, uh, which provide enhancement in this case, uh, we uh, actually accomplished recently uh, another development by replacing the spherical core shell structures with uh, the spheroidal one. Uh, we actually obtained higher quality effect and more importantly, uh, the larger field confinement, smaller volume of electromagnetic energy is uh, concentrated, and in this case, uh, we obtain very high figure of uh, uh, merit, the Purcell factor, which is characterizing, basically, which is roughly the ratio of quality factor and the volume where uh, the energy is confined. So in our case, it was 10 to the 4. Uh, coming back to this uh, uh, gap, surface uh, plasma gap uh, nanolaser. So this is recent work which comes from a group uh, from uh, Taiwan uh, University of Texas, Austin, and Bijin. So uh, they use a similar structure as uh, the Shang Zhang's group in Berkeley did, but they replaced silver plate with epitaxially grown silver. I, I will speak about materials quite a bit during my presentation because this is really what I believe is critical for the field to improve material components which we use to build these materials. And by using this epitaxial silver, which has smaller losses, that they were able to decrease the threshold by two orders of magnitude so that the lasing 
uh, was possible uh, in CW regime, and uh, although still at cryogenic temperatures. Yet another very interesting development in the area of nanolasers, nanoscale lasers, this work comes from uh, uh, Shia Feynman group in, at, uh, from University of uh, California, San Diego. They used this uh, coaxial metal laser, and they placed uh, the amplifying medium uh, uh, based on uh, quantum valinium gallium arsenide phosphide in this case uh, inside and because of the extremely uh, high confinement uh, uh, of modes, in this case they were very sparse so that uh, within very broad range of powers only one mode actually was generated as it's shown here. You see the very pump power in very broad, spec sorry, very broad range and they still have only single mode generated. And what, what is interesting, uh, because of this extremely high confinement, at low temperature at least they obtain uh, nearly thresholdless generation as, it, oops, as it's shown here. So to, to sum up this uh, introductory part, in the area of nanophotonics, a number of key elements have been already demonstrated, including nanoantennas, nanolasers, uh, uh, photo detectors, optical modulators. So the hope here that at some point we will have the full functionality for nanophotonic circuitry, similar which we have with electronics, but hopefully we would be able to process informa information much faster. So to demonstrate how functional materials are becoming, uh, I will show several uh, applications which in my opinion are quite important. And people keep talking now about photovoltaics a lot, uh, and in that sense, the, uh, we hope that plasmonic also could play some role in improving the efficiency of photovoltaic elements. And the idea typically here uh, is related to one of these three approaches. In one case, you place these metallic uh, particles to simply uh, induce this broad angle scattering so that you effectively increase uh, propagation, uh, photon propagation length and the, in, in the solar cell, or you could simply uh, rely on the enhanced local fields produced by these plasmonic nanoparticles, and by doing so, you would increase the efficiency of electron hole generation. Finally, you could also use these periodical uh, metallic structures which are capable of excitation and supporting surface plasma polariton, which effectively also increase the optical propagation length uh, in solar cells. That's three different approaches uh, which people use and try to bring plasmonics into the field of photovoltaics. I should say, though, that uh, photovoltaic elements is already extremely efficient. If you speak of silicon, it's, they're already getting close to the Shockley limit, and if you say also there are already demonstration of a very thin crystal uh, solar cells with efficiency about 29%, but uh, the field is so important that even if uh, the, uh, the increase would be just few percent, it could make a, a huge difference for the field. And of course, the key element in all these photovoltaic elements is to have very efficient absorption. Here you could see work done by uh, Harriet Water. By the way, recently Harriet Water and Albert Pullman got the Energy Prize, which is a very prestigious prize, and for their work uh, by, uh, related to using this uh, uh, nanophotonic elements and uh, to improve photovoltaics. In this case, they use these trapezoidally shaped structures which are basically metal insulated metal waveguides uh, with uh, silver being metal and uh, insulated is just silica. And they showed very strong uh, extinction uh, for a very uh, broad range of uh, angle of incidence and in a broad uh, spectral range. And of course, the, uh, the hope here to replace silica with uh, photovoltaically active uh, elements such as silicon. Uh, speaking of these perfect absorbers, as they call them, uh, materials which absorb uh, uh, light in a very broad spectral range and for uh, uh, all angles of incidence, I was impressed with this work by uh, coming from the Bajewani group. He used simple uh, metal discs uh, sitting uh, atop of a metal plate of different sizes, and they support so called gap uh, surface plasma resonance and they resonate at different wavelengths so that all together they actually absorb uh, light in the whole, through all the visible part of the range and uh, for all the polarization, unpolarized light, you see. And the, uh, abs uh, the absorption is actually 94%. It's a very efficient uh, uh, absorber. 
Yet in other structure, uh, they use uh, uh, these ultra sharp convex uh, metallic grooves, V shaped grooves. And in this case, uh, what a very interesting phenomenon occurs actually, surface, gap surface plasmons adiabatically propagate through this structure, uh, slow down, eventually stop, and at that point, absorb. So in, in this case, here, they also accomplished very strong absorption in a, an extremely broad spectral range for often polarized light. And that's, of course, as I said, a key element to improve photovoltaic elements to have absorption in the broad spectral range and uh, at all angles of incidence and uh, all polarizations. Uh, yet another very interesting development in, in the area related to generation uh, of electrical energy by using this plasmonic structure uh, that comes from a Hyatt Water Group, sorry. And so the idea here, if you have a couple plasmonic particles which uh, are different in size, or you could have actually the same part, the same in size particles, but irradiate them at different wavelengths. In both cases, uh, you, the heat which absorbed by these particles when you excite these uh, plasma oscillations uh, would be different, and that would result in gradient in temperature. And because of the thermoelectric effect, you would start generating current. So, but uh, the surprising thing, the efficiency is actually quite high, 14, uh, above 14 percent. So, in these metallic particles, it's also you see in this particular case, you use these plasmonic structures not to increase the photovoltaic uh, element, but rather to directly generate light. Also. Uh, quite interesting uh, development, in my opinion. Well, with uh, metamaterials, you could also control the very basic uh, things related to uh, black body radiation, and uh, specifically, you could control thermal emitters, uh, properties of thermal emitters. And in this particular case, you have uh, metallic structures, and with uh, sort of metamaterial structures, uh, when you could exactly control the frequency. Uh, where electrical and magnetic resonances occur. Uh, you could, for example, make it so that there is only one resonance or two resonances uh, for these two different structures shown in the pictures. And uh, uh, the thermal equilibrium, of course, according to the Kirchhoff's law, uh, uh, emission uh, should just match it to be equal to uh, absorption. And uh, therefore, actually, what you have that uh, um, emission occurs in this case at the particular wavelengths for this structure, just at this one uh, resonant frequency and at this at two this frequency. And when you compare it to the uh, black carbon, uh, which is just a black body radiative object, so of course it's dramatically different. This is just one example how you could control uh, on nanoscale actually thermal radiation and uh, heat, and that's actually a very, very promising approach for a number of applications. And this work, particular work uh, has been done by uh, Willy Padilla Group. Uh, one of the key uh, things which we need to accomplish with metamaterials is to make them switchable and uh, tunable, which is, of course, very important for, uh, for many applications which we have in mind. And uh, the uh, very pioneering work in this area has been done by Zolodev's group. First, he proposed this uh, uh, structure uh, using typical magnetic metamaterial structure like split ring resonators. And uh, it's a very simple idea. If you uh, use materials which with very different uh, a thermal expansion coefficients, in this case silicon, nitrite, and gold. So when you heat it up, of course, the structure would bend. And when the structure bends, you slightly change the sizes uh, in your, uh, of your metamaterial elements, and therefore you shift the frequency, as it's shown here. And, but that was the first demonstration, but clearly from there, from that point, it was clear that you actually could make structures typical, similar to MEMS or NAMS uh, for metamaterial applications. And below you could see uh, two other structures, which are basically a micro machine, the uh, magnetic metamaterials which uh, enable uh, magnetic response uh, in the terahertz spectral range. They use these uh, usual split ring resonators, and you basically what you could do, you could either open up split ring resonator structure, you could close it up, and when you do so, then of course uh, the magnetic response like, changes dramatically. And in this particular case, it can go from negative to positive. Or you could have two, uh, two layers of this split ring resonators, as it's shown here, and just move one uh, with respect to another. And in this particular case, they show again uh, this switching capability for terahertz uh, magnetic response. This uh, works have been done in collaboration between several groups from Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, that work done by Professor D.P. Tsai, Southampton, that work uh, led by uh, Nikolai Zolodiv. 
And he just reported today actually by using uh, extremely large electro-optical effect where you could control this uh, switching capability with uh, applied electrical field. So the uh, progress here is quite impressive, I should say. Yet another uh, thing where you control uh, properties of your metamaterial by uh, uh, through nonlinear response, actually, either optically or electrically. That uh, work comes from uh, uh, Costa Sakulis group. He uses this structure which uh, has this uh, photoconductive silicon. And so when the silicon is actually uh, conducts, when you radiate it with light, and so you induce uh, charge carriers and becomes conductive, there is uh, a shift from this uh, low frequency mode to high frequency mode. And basically what it means that when you radiate it with light, uh, then uh, you shift from this uh, uh, resonance to this one. Uh, so, and which you could, of course, detect by using this pop prop uh, experiment. So, in this case, you have the electric PMTH, which depends on intensity. So, this is nonlinear, actually, way to control response of metamaterials. I already mentioned that graphene, of course, enters uh, in the area of metamaterials and breeds uh, lots of interesting functionality. And uh, this is uh, also a very interesting experiment where uh, people look at the plasma uh, resonance of uh, graphene uh, uh, ribbons shown here. Uh, in general, why they so, uh, well, at least from my perspective, the interest toward graphene because he, it could be used as unified platform for both for electronic circuitry and photonic circuitry. And the fact that the same material, which has such a wonderful electronic properties, uh, uh, also has very interesting plasmonic uh, properties, at least in the mid infrared, it's, uh, it's very promising, as I said, because you could do uh, on the same uh, platform uh, electronic and photonic circuitry. So in this case, uh, by you have these ribbons of graphene, and by applying the voltage, you change the carrier concentration, and of course, by doing so, you shift the uh, plasma resonance because it's proportional to the uh, uh, charge carrier concentration. And that effect occurs, of course, only for the polarization perpendicular to the ribbon when you uh, polarize it along the ribbon, so that there is no this effect. Of course, you could obtain similar effect by uh, simply changing the, the width of these uh, graphene uh, ribbons. And uh, well, there is lots of actually uh, very, very promising work has been done recently in graphene. Here you could see two papers uh, publishing the same issue of nature, one coming from uh, uh, groups uh, of Coppens and uh, uh, Javier de Abaja, and another one coming from the uh, UC San Diego group led by uh, 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 Dima Basov. So they use actually this, uh, uh, they studied surface plasma polaritons on graphite, which could be excited by using the tip of near field scanning optical microscope. And the same, the same uh, tip could be used to, to detect this, uh, the excitation of surface plasma polaritons. So, and, and what is important here that uh, they demonstrated that indeed this uh, surface plasma polariton could propagate for significant uh, length. So, and it turns out that the uh, wavelengths of surface plasma polariton uh, is significantly smaller than the wavelengths in free space by a factor of 40 or 50, which could be considered as a figure of merit in a sense, uh, because you uh, uh, could propagate, at least that has been demonstrated experimentally, uh, for a distance of several tenths of these uh, 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 wavelengths of surface plasma and polaritons. So again, there is a very promising development here that uh, graphene could be used for various nanophotonic applications along with electronic ones, and that uh, looks very, very attractive. Well, uh, if you would be able to control phase of materials, which yet another very important degree of freedom, that of course uh, would enable even more functionality, and that in the area of coherent material, there are lots of very interesting work has been done here. I wouldn't be able to go through this. I've, I mentioned very few, but that at least would give you a flavor of activity in this area. So this uh, an example of a uh, Bragg stack of plasmonic structures, uh, which could be arranged in such a way that uh, when light uh, propagates in forward direction, uh, the interference is fully uh, destructive, so that light actually cannot go through your ma uh, material. And when it propagates in the backward direction, then uh, the interference is constructive, so that light is fully reflected. And you could create actually a band gap stop uh, a gap uh, extremely large with, with the width uh, uh, close to one EV, and you could see here that in this range you uh, have uh, almost all light uh, reflected with no transmittance. Well, speaking of uh, interference, uh, there is lots of activity related to 
so-called funnel resonance because it's a classical interference effect. Normally it involves uh, some broadband resonance uh, and typically low quality resonance and uh, very sharp resonance, uh, typically it's dark, dark mode. And uh, in this case, because of the interference, you could have extremely sharp structures. And well, this, for example, is a structure where you could have uh, interference between propagating surface plasmon polariton in these periodical structures and localized surface plasmon excitations, and you have this uh, funnel resonance. This structure that uh, comes from a uh, Harald Giesen group. That structure is. Uh, th that's a uh, result comes from uh, Nikolai Zolodev's group uh, where he uh, demonstrated this funnel resonance uh, um, by using interference between these uh, low quality electrical dipole excitations which shown in one and three and uh, high quality uh, dark mode which is associated with magnetic dipole excitations. And you have very, very sharp feature here which is associated with this funnel resonance. You could also uh, functionalize these elements by placing uh, carbon nanotubes uh, as done by Zolodev's group, also graphene, and you could obtain a dramatically enhanced nonlinear response in these structures. So very interesting development. So you could see here, for example, that you employ nonlinear response and you also employ interference effects. <coughs> this recent work coming from uh, Naomi Hala's group, uh, which shows that you could control these uh, uh, basic characteristics of funnel resonance uh, by using this cluster of metallic particles and by changing the separation between particles and uh, their sizes, you could really uh, accomplish uh, uh, whatever you want in terms of the magnitude of this funnel resonance and the position. A very important feature here that uh, by using uh, elect uh, excitation of these plasma nodes with electron beams, you could excite it locally because this funnel resonance, it's always kind of interference effect. It involves uh, different modes and interference between them. But by using this uh, E-beam, uh, you could actually excite a particular particle in this cluster. For example, internal one, then you would have this blue resonance, or external one, when you have this red resonance. But when you excite it with, white, with light, sorry, uh, then you have this funnel resonance because you have this interference between, uh, in this case, superradiant and two subradiant modes, uh, which interfere and result in this uh, funnel structure. Since I mentioned this uh, uh, excitation of uh, very spe special uh, excitation of particles, this very high special resolution by using E-beam, I, I, I'd like to mention very briefly a couple of these works. This work comes from uh, Jennifer Dyne, with, uh, with, where they studied this localized surface plasma resonance, which is in the heart of all plasmonic applications, and they verified the basics uh, about this uh, localized surface plasma resonance by using this electron energy loss spectroscopy. And in fact, you could really obtain spectacular special resolution and also time resolution. This work uh, done by ZWL group from Caltech. And it's amazing that you could, when you do this, when you use this uh, electron energy um, uh, loss spectroscopy, you could actually do four dimensional nanomicroscopy. Nano Not only you would have this special resolution on the nanoscale, but also you could uh, study these processes with femtosecond uh, time resolution. Okay, uh, as in many fields, uh, uh, it's great to have these wonderful ideas, but to realize them, it uh, quite often comes down to uh, material components which you use. And with metamaterials, one of the uh, biggest obstacles is actually high losses, uh, which are associated with metallic components typically used for metamaterials. And although you could compensate them uh, with active components, and there is interesting work done in that area by a number of groups, and I mentioned just a few of them, uh, Anatoly Zayed from UK, Mikhail Nogina from Norfolk, Nikolai Zolodiv, and many others actually. But it would be, uh, the work would be much easier if you would use components with smaller losses. But I should say losses are not, not, the, not the only problem. Uh, you also would like to have these components tunable where you could control their basic properties and also you would like these components uh, uh, to integrate with other, which, uh, which is a very critical for applications. And uh, quite recently, there is very spectacular work in that area. And I mentioned just a few groups, uh, like Martin Wegener did very nice work here, Harriet Water, again, Nogina, whom I already mentioned. And I, I'll, I'll speak in more detail about work by my colleague, Alexandra Baltasola, in, the, in this field by trying to develop uh, components for building metamaterials with better properties, more appropriate properties. 
And uh, just to, to give you the idea why we have this problem, uh, with silver and gold, which normally considered to be the material of choice in terms of uh, plasmonic uh, materials, the plasma frequency is actually very high, it's 9 eV. And to, to get uh, negative dielectric permittivity, and that's what actually makes material plasmonic, the frequency should be smaller than 9 eV, but 9 eV, it's really deep low ultraviolet. It means that when you go to the, for example, telecommunication wavelengths, your dielectric permittivity becomes extremely large in magnitude. Uh, minus 100 or even more, much larger than in magnitude than the electric permittivities of the electric components, which typically you use together with metallic ones. So that they kind of mismatch, and it's hard to make materials with kind of balanced, effective dielectric permittivity. Uh, yet another problem, the loss is also proportional to the plasma frequency squared. And having that large plasma frequency uh, just makes losses even larger than we would like them to be. So in a sense, metals are too metallic for us. We would like to have a, a density of charge carriers, in some cases at least smaller. Or ideally, we would like to control it. We would like to be able to switch the uh, density of charge carriers to bring it into the range where we want to make it 1 eV, 2 eV, 0.1 eV, so whatever. And uh, this is kind of a very important work, in my opinion, done by Harriet Water and Alexander Boltasio, where they actually showed a roadmap for developing new material components and showed that you actually could design this uh, and engineer these plasmonic properties by uh, using very different approaches, making it a met uh, metals less metallic, and in that uh, sense, uh, materials such as intermetallics, for example, are very promising. Or using, for example, transparent conducting oxides, which you could adopt to very high level and uh, uh, making them plasmonics and for example, in the near infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, here is an example from a, a Baltasova group where they show that these highly doped transparent conducting oxides, oxides such as uh, gallium doped zinc oxide and aluminum doped zinc oxide, where epsilon prime becomes no negative uh, uh, above two microns, so close to telecommunication wavelengths, the imaginary part actually could be smaller several by fact, by fact of three to five than in silver, and silver is considered to be like the material of, of choice. So you could see that epsilon could be negative, not necessarily minus 100, which sometimes actually is a problem, uh, for, at least for some applications and the imaginary part could be smaller. This is an example how you could really engineer plasmonic materials with desired properties. Uh, when you think of the visible part of the spectrum, very promising material is actually titanium nitrate, uh, which is used for a number of interesting applications. And this is, by the way, they used also for these uh, domes in churches, and look how this, uh, look at this luster, it looks like gold, which indicate that it should have very similar properties to gold. And indeed, uh, it does actually. So it's similar to gold, but it has certain advantages over gold. And the Baltasio group recently showed that indeed it could operate as, uh, uh, as a plasmonic material, for example, it supports surface plasma and polariton, and you could grow them with epitaxial accuracy, so it could be extremely flat. So promising material for the plasmonic materials for the visible part of the spectrum. At least for some applications, such as very important hyperbolic materials, which I speak a bit more later, uh, you could, they actually showed that these transparent conducting oxides and titanium nitride outperform traditional plasmonic materials by several orders of magnitude. So, and just to illustrate that these materials indeed could, uh, uh, could work as met materials, uh, we showed negative refraction of these materials. Specific, specifically, we use a stack of these uh, plasmonic materials based on aluminum doped zinc oxide, uh, uh, which was with uh, zinc oxide in between, and we showed that indeed there is negative refraction in this case with quite a very decent, uh, decent figure of merit of 11. And by the way, if the same structure would be used in silver or gold, the figure of merit would be two to three orders of magnitude less. So a few words about hyperbolic materials. That, uh, I, that's materials probably with most promising application, and that work uh, to a large extent has been uh, inspired by my colleague Evgeny Narimanov, and also his collaborative work with Smolininov, David Smith, and Aidan Geta. So uh, I just show one particular one, uh, work. So what is special about these materials that if you look at the iso frequency in K space for conventional dielectric materials, uh, it's uh, the, the uh, 
it's a bound surface, meaning that the k vector cannot exceed certain uh, certain uh, number. So, but however, if one of the epsilon is negative, so hyperbolic material is kind of unusual. The dielectric in one direction, but metal in another direction. So you could see that instead of having a sphere, you uh, get a hyperbola. Uh, and you could have uh, this type of hyperbolic dispersion either in material like this, which can includes these plasmonic nanowires, or a stack of materials, plasmonic and dielectric ones. And uh, I've just mentioned one experiment which uh, uh, has been done by Satoshi Ishii in my group. We just used this hyperbolic material, and so uh, if you have a, uh, um, a hole here, then of course energy propagates perpendicular to this hyperbolic iso frequency. And if you have two holes because of the interference, you would have a spot which could be much smaller than the wavelength because, uh, because of this uh, access to very large K, which could be much larger than the omega over C. And indeed, that has been uh, verified experimentally. If you play the structure on top of the foot resist, so we would obtain hot as a result of this interference between high K modes propagating in hyperbolic materials, which would be only 18 nanometers, which is six times smaller than the wavelengths, and so uh, clearly beats the diffraction limit. So this work done by Shang Zheng, a recent work where he used this uh, uh, cavities based on hyperbolic materials, and again, because this in hyperbolic materials, they are propagating modes with very large Ks, uh, they basically were able to uh, make cavities uh, which operate, which only, which tw 12 times smaller than the wavelength and still support this cavity mode, uh, which basically means that the effective refractive index in these structures could be very large, in this particular case, like 17. Uh, that's demonstrate that with hyperbolic materials, you indeed could go deeply uh, beyond the diffraction limit. And in the end, I'd like to discuss this meta surfaces, uh, which, uh, Kind of quite exciting development was inspired by Federico Capasa uh, work uh, last year, and uh, this also demonstrates how really very new things coming in this field, even in the areas where one had to expect anything new. And it comes down to the very fundamental things, such as refraction and reflection, uh, uh, and that, that has been that's in turn related to this Mapur two principle. Uh, which actually uh, formulated this, the principle of least action, and he wrote actually in a philosophical way, nature is thrifty uh, in all its actions, never formulated it mathematically, and only two months later, it was 1744 by the way, Ehler formulated it in the form in the, uh, which we use nowadays in the mathematical form. It's interesting that he never actually claimed any priority, although he was the one who formulated it in the form we use it now. And then if you use yet another uh, discovery by Louis de Broglie, who uh, actually pointed out toward the dualism of particles and waves, so, and related this momentum, which is a characteristic of particles to wave vector characterizing waves, and substituted to the Mopur 2 principle, you would immediately end up with Fermat principle, which tells us that light propagates in such a way that the optical path, which is given by the product of refractive index and geometrical path, should be minimized. And when you apply this principle uh, to light going through interface between two materials, you would immediately uh, arrive at this well-known law of reflection, which says the angle of reflection is equal to the, equal to the angle of reflect, uh, incidence, and refraction, which uh, uh, relates the angle of refraction to the angle of incidence through these refractive indices. But normally it implies there is no any gradient of phase along the interface. And what the uh, Federica Capasa group pointed out, if there is the, the gradient here, if you break the symmetry and if there is a strong gradient of phase, singularity in phase, then actually uh, another term has to be added to this uh, uh, famous uh, loss of reflection and uh, re refraction, uh, gradient of phase. And it's, uh, it's probably easier to understand in terms of momentum conservation. So light propagates in such a way that the lat latitudinal uh, uh, projection of momentum should be conserved, and if you have a gradient of phase, then indeed uh, you should add here, and that would redirect refracted light. So it uh, appears that if you put a, a ray of antennas and you would control the coupling to the light, you could introduce any uh, gradient of phase you want, and by doing so, you introduce the momentum, and that means you could uh, direct your light in any possible directions. So and the thickness of these antennas could be arbitrary small, much smaller than wavelengths, which makes them different, from, for example, from blaze gradient, uh, which has to be uh, comparable to the wavelength. So it's a different 
uh, way of uh, uh, introducing the gradient of phase in this case. This is the structure which uh, uh, the capacitor group used these V antennas. They clearly introduced the gradient of phase. And because it's actually not continuous, so you still have this conventionally reflected beam and conventionally refracted beam. But in addition to that, you have this beam which experiences anomalous reflection and anomalous refraction as well. And it could go in any direction depending on the gradient of phase which you introduce. So they did it for eight microns for the mid-infrared. So we followed up and did similar experiment for the uh, important telecommunication wavelengths. So this is our structure, and we show that indeed uh, there is this, uh, you could send refracted beam in any direction by uh, creating this uh, array of antennas which uh, introduces the gradient of phase, whatever, whatever which is needed. So we showed it for the telecommunication wavelengths, and you can see that indeed there is this negative refraction, and depending on the period of the structure, refracted beam could go in any direction you want. This is just different samples. So for one sample with one gradient, it goes this direction for another, this direction, and so on and so forth. And the agreement between this generalized Snell's law, uh, numerical simulation, and experiment just perfect. So it's, it's this works just perfectly. Same with reflection. You could send it in any direction. And this is a broadband, very robust effect. We showed that it occurs between one to two micron. It's not uh, exotic effect. It's a very broad effect, broadband and very robust effect. So we, which opens up a number of interesting applications, such as, for example, special light modulator used in all TV sets, which could be uh, made extremely thin, much smaller than the wavelengths. In our case, for example, this array of antennas, we are 30 times smaller than the wavelengths. Well, you could make also a metal lens. This recent experiment uh, done by Shin uh, in my group. So he used these V antennas to make this uh, metal lens, <laughs> you could see that you uh, introduce very strong gradient of phase, shown here is a function of radius, you change it by two pi, and you could make it so that uh, constructive interference occurs at any point uh, beyond the lens. So here you could see, for example, that this lens has extremely strong focusing ability. It focuses light, uh, depending on what kind of metal lens you use, 2.5 or 4 micron uh, behind the lens and to the spot which is comparable in size to the wavelengths. This is just one example, but there are plenty other uh, very interesting applications related to uh, metasurfaces. This brings me to the conclusion. <laughs> so what I tried to uh, show you today that uh, metamaterials is indeed a very exciting uh, field for the science of light. And in this case, you limit it only basically by your imagination. You could do anything with light uh, by designing and engineering the required properties of the parameters which control the interaction with light, namely dielectric permittivity and magnetic permeability. And I showed that, uh, for example, with metamaterials, you could develop all the key elements for future nanophotonic circuitry, uh, optical modulators, nanoantennas, nanolasers, uh, I showed you a number of functional materials which could find very important applications, such as materials used for photovoltaic elements, harvesting energy, harvesting light, generating electrical energy, and control thermal, uh, controlling thermal radiation. With the materials becoming tunable and switchable, uh, nonlinear, uh, they really becoming functional in that sense. We now employ in phase, so they could act as a coherent elements. Uh, what really brings hope here that we are using now components which are compatible with uh, current uh, semiconductor industry. So materials such as titanium nitride or transparent conducting oxides, of course, they are the same materials which people in semiconductor industry use, which are already in a conventional uh, CMOS uh, fabrication line. That uh, uh, brings the, uh, the hope that these materials really would become devices, metal devices uh, in the very near future. They're already becoming such. So, and uh, there are very interesting applications uh, such as hyperbolic metamaterials. Indeed, you could use metamaterials to beat the diffraction limit. And uh, things, new things keep coming in this area, such metasurfaces, for example, uh, you actually could change very fundamentals in the science of light, not change, but further develop, better to say. And I just pointed out how with metasurfaces, uh, you could actually control light bending, make uh, beam steering, beam shaping, a new type of phase modulators, 
uh, as I said, you're really limited only with your imagination when you uh, work in the field of metamaterials. Thank you very much.